Thumbs up. That's good. All right. Are you ready, Dr. Shives? Ready. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. The Mayo Clinic Cancer Center recently received a grant from the National Cancer Institute to help cancer patients who use tobacco get treatment to help them kick the habit. The two-year, $500,000 grant is part of the National Cancer Institute's Cancer Moonshot Initiative, and it'll fund programs at Mayo Clinic Cancer Center and the Mayo Clinic Nicotine Dependence Center. Now, the grant will help expand tobacco cessation treatment services for cancer patients at Mayo Clinic. And here to discuss is the medical director for the Mayo Clinic Nicotine Dependence Center, Dr. J. Taylor Hayes, and Mayo Clinic hematologist, Dr. Carrie Thompson. Welcome both of you back to the program. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Uh, Good to have you both here. And I think the first question is, isn't it a little late to quit smoking when you've already been diagnosed (laughs) with cancer? Well, that's a great question. Um, There are many cancers that are related to tobacco use, but there are many cancer patients who have other malignancies that aren't related to tobacco use. So there's there's many advantages to meeting people at the time of a, a cancer diagnosis. We know that smoking may interfere with their treatment. So chemotherapy levels may be altered up or down with the concurrent nicotine use. Also, it's a teachable moment, so people are generally pretty motivated to improve their health when they're diagnosed with a malignancy. So it's actually a a great time to to reach individuals. And lastly, there's other treatments of cancer that can increase um, the risk of developing another malignancy, such as radiation therapy. And so even if the cancer isn't directly related to current smoking, we want to do whatever we can to improve their long-term health. Dr. Hayes, is the cancer cessation for uh, is can, is smoking cessation different for cancer patients than it is other regular patients? No, the same things help them quit as anyone else. In fact, you know, it, the cancer moment <laughs> is really a teachable moment. It's like when people come in the hospital and suddenly they're in a an environment where they can't smoke. And they have an illness often that has brought them there being caused by tobacco. So cancer uh, diagnosis is a teachable moment for them. And, and so we think that um, they have the same opportunity as everyone else, uh, but the difference is now they have this new diagnosis. And all the things that Dr. Thompson just talked about that may be benefited, including their overall health, but the immediate treatment in front of them may, may be provided in a better way less toxicity, better quality of life when they complete treatment if they're able to stop smoking. The uh, smoking rate in the general population is about 20%. Is it similar in cancer patients? About 20% of the patients that you see are smokers? So, so that number's changed. Overall population prevalence now is probably closer to 14 to 15%. So oh, wow. we've really done a great job. Oh, no kidding. Uh, yeah, catch up, Dr. Shives. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's changed pretty rapidly, in fact. And in Minnesota, the same thing. We see about a 14 15% adult population prevalence of smoking. We think it's the same in cancer patients. There may be some cancer diagnoses where the prevalence is higher, and you might guess what those are. So the ones that are highly correlated with tobacco use, like lung cancer, head and neck cancers, where tobacco is the primary cause, we will see higher prevalence of smoking in those groups. Yeah, we always think of of lung cancer being related to tobacco use. Head and neck cancer you mentioned. Are there others that are smoking related? Carrie? There are other other malignancies such as bladder cancer. That's not well known that, that smoking can increase that risk. Um, some GI malignancies are also increased, um, have an increased risk in, in smokers. So gastrointestinal colon, stomach, yeah. for example? Correct. Mm-hmm. And uh, the most effective methods. You mentioned that they're, they're the same for cancer patients as for the regular population. What are those? What, what's, you must be doing something right if the smoking rate is all the way down to 14 or 15 percent. So, so how are you doing it now? You, you've talked to me so many times before. You know the answer <laughs> to, to this question. <laughs> well, it, I don't know. Uh, it, that was when the smoking <laughs> rate was higher. You, we you, thought he did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really uh, simple, not easy. 
The simple answer is it's a combination of behavioral therapy, typically counseling and support, and effective uh, medication treatment to reduce withdrawal and reduce those urges to smoke that really drive people to relapse so quickly when they try to quit. It's uh, being diagnosed with cancer, though, is a pretty stressful time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a double stress to try to give up smoking, which helps you relieve stress, if that's the re one of the main reasons you smoke. Are you finding that it's extra hard for cancer patients? Or what is some of the response that you're getting? I think that um, teachable moment actually is more uh, driving peop people's behavior as opposed to the stress. When we meet people in the in the cancer clinic, they know that they shouldn't be smoking. They've probably tried to quit many times in the past, and they want to do whatever they can to control what feels like an uncontrollable situation. And therefore, I find that patients are actually very motivated and ready to um, seek nicotine cessation at, at that time. Uh, and not just the patient, but oftentimes the family members as well. Sure. One mm -hmm. other response to that is, um, stress, yes, is increased in the short term when people try to quit smoking, but we're, we're really talking about a few days where the stress levels are very high. If you look at all smokers and you look at them a few weeks later, psychological distress from whatever source is remarkably reduced in people who are successfully abstinent from smoking. So you mentioned uh, behavioral therapy, and I want to hear a little bit more about that, but is Chantex still the best medication you have, and do you rely on nicotine replacement still? So I'll take the last part of that first. Um, yes, when we look at comparative effectiveness uh, in head-to-head -head testing, the Chantix varenicline medication appears to be better than any other single drug, the nicotine replacement therapy and the bupropion or Zyban drug. We still use nicotine replacement therapy. It's still very effective, and sometimes we use some combinations of medications that also may be effective, especially for people who have more tobacco dependence. And behavioral therapies are really, uh, so I'm not a behavioral therapist, but so I have to think about it quite simply. Sure. Um, and it's really uh, what I tell myself and what I do, those things need to change. So we call it, the fancy term is cognitive behavioral is one approach. It's changing the way you think about the use of this drug and changing the patterns of behavior that surround the use of the drug, whatever it is. In this case, it's uh, tobacco. So rather than telling yourself, I got to have one, I got to have one, you start changing the conversation in your head. So Dr. Thompson, one other question. If, uh, is there evidence that if you get a cancer patient to stop smoking, they'll live longer? I think there's evidence in the general population of, of that, certainly. We know that they'll have better responses to chemotherapy in that they're, we're taking away the potential drug-drug interactions. Um, one of the major issues for cancer patients long-term is also cardiovascular disease. So if we decrease the risk of nicotine um, uh, exposure, that may help people live longer. And then, of course, the uh, risk of developing another smoking-related cancer or, or a new one. Uh, so I think there's a lot of, a lot of good evidence on, on why this is uh, so important for our patients. Is your success rate in getting patients with cancer to quit smoking better than the general population? So that varies by diagnosis, and there aren't a lot of studies that have looked at just particular diagnoses, but, but generally uh, they are high if you have a directly tobacco-related diagnosis. So if you have a—there are studies of people who, for instance, have come into the hospital for surgery for lung cancer. Those people will have a 60 or 70 percent success rate uh, if they're provided some treatment in the hospital. And that's usually better than we have in a, an ambulatory clinic where people are— otherwise healthy, don't, don't have an, a serious illness right in front of them. Yeah, what a great program. We've been talking about a National Cancer Institute grant that Mayo Clinic is using to help cancer patients quit using tobacco with the medical director for the Mayo Clinic Nicotine Dependence Center, Dr. J. Taylor Hayes, and Mayo Clinic hematologist, blood specialist, Dr. Carrie Thompson. Thanks to both of you for being with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, thanks.